Thank you very much for the invitation to actually be here and to tell you a little bit about some of the IYCR outreach activities that we have been up to. So I decided to call it Fun with Crystals, Light and Symmetry because if we don't have fun, our outreach activities really won't go anywhere. But first and foremost, I have the privilege to talk here, but I have not done all of these things. There is actually a group called the IYCR Task Force of the ACA, and here are the pictures of all the people that are on their task force. <laughs> there are also a lot of other people, some of which I will be mentioning by name throughout this talk. So thank you to all of you who have been part of this and who have actually made this happen, because without that, I wouldn't have anything to talk about here. So let's actually have a brief look at the International Year of Crystallography, which is what we are celebrating here. 2014 is the International Year for Crystallography. The plans for this did start earlier, but there were some obstacles that had to be overcome, mainly political, organizational, things like that. But it wasn't really that critical which of these years would be the IYCR, because we are within a four-year time span that really lends itself to a celebration because we are celebrating 100 years of, first of all, the first diffraction experiment by Max von Laue in 1912. Then, of course, the publication of Bragg's Law and the solution of the first crystal structures in 1913, and the Nobel Prizes to von Laue and the Bragg's in 1914 and 15. So as you can see, we are kind of in a four-year centennial celebration here, and celebrations did start a little bit earlier than 2014, and we will continue a little bit beyond 2014. So it's very appropriate in that respect that we have this year now. Now what are some of the goals? We got together with the task force and talked about what do we want to achieve with IYCR 2014. And one of the big things is that we want to excite the general public and of course especially students that might be the future crystallographers about crystallography. Because back then, as you can see from the rapid global prices, people really recognized how important these contributions were. But nowadays, if you ask somebody about crystallography, some people might come up with very strange answers that have nothing to do with what we call crystallography. So that means we need to do some K-12 and community outreach. We need to go to schools, museums, maybe work with scouts or other groups. Whoever is interested in learning about crystallography, we should go to them and teach them. Of course, another big issue is that we would like to get more recognition from colleagues in related fields, because we understand that Chris Lockley has made important contributions to all the science and engineering disciplines, but not all scientists and engineers actually acknowledge that. And that is our job to make sure that with professional outreach, we get them on board. And of course, we need to improve the appreciation for Chris Lockley in general, if you want to sum it up because that, of course, means that we have a basis based on which we can exist in the future, get funding, have our meetings, teach more people, and have further advances in this field. That, of course, means that we need to make sure that we have educational materials available and that we reach a lot. <coughs> so I kind of divided this into three little subsections, and then I'll have some special activities that have been done this year. So the first one is fun with crystals, which I like to call the obvious side of crystallography. I mean, who doesn't know crystals and who doesn't like crystals? As a matter of fact, you can probably ask some little kids whether they know what a crystal is, and the answer will be yes. Everybody knows that solids with nice, well-defined, shiny faces are crystals, right? And here's an example of the heaviest quartz crystal group that exists in the world. This one is 7.4 tons. It actually was dug up in western Arkansas. It resides in Germany. I'm not sure how that happened, but I happened to be at this museum and take some pictures, so it seems pretty appropriate. Now, we may not have this one available for our daily outreach, right? But crystals are a great place to connect. So what we can use when we talk to groups of students are maybe things like this. This is one that I have sitting in my office. Again, a quartz crystal. And of course, we all know that quartz comes in some colored variants. I have some citron and amethyst <coughs> here. So this is a great place to start talking about the fact that elemental composition and structure really matter when it comes to solids. In this case, impurity atoms actually lend beauty to our crystals. And the kids do appreciate that when you teach them about this. Of course, the other thing that is really exciting to most people is not just to look at crystals, but to make your own. So one of the things that I often do when I do outreach is I make kids grow crystal gardens. So you use a water glass solution and some metal salts. 
And these things grow within minutes, so it's great because they can actually sit there and watch their crystals grow and usually they are very happy to take home their little mementos. And so they have something that reminds them of these little things that they have learned about crystals and crystallography, which again in the long run will hopefully lead to them appreciating crystallography. Of course, these aren't really what we would call good crystals, right? It more looks like an underwater coral or rock garden. If you actually want to do something that is more like a crystal, the University of Tennessee, Claudia Ron and some of her graduate students, actually kind of pioneered a crystal jars experiment. And they actually got a local grant to do this with some Girl Scout groups. And this is all stuff that is readily available at a local grocery. Materials are non-hazardous, so you can even do it with little kits. The approximate cost for those is about a dollar per jar. And it's very optical and visible. You can do it with anybody. And of course, once the kits are ordered, you can introduce more things, like how do you experiment with crystallization? Heating, cooling rates, putting things in there. One of the nice things is, this one uses borax, and you can color borax crystals just by adding some food coloring. So of course the kids like their colored crystals. So this is what a crystal jar looks like. You have the jar, you have some borax, you have some pipe cleaners, a popsicle stick, and some dental floss. And basically the way you do it is, you grow your crystals on your pipe cleaners. The dental floss is used to suspend the formations because it is waxed, nothing will grow on it, so that's kind of nice, it stays clean. And you basically just heat water, put the borax in it, dissolve it, and then you watch things crystallize. This takes a few hours, so if you have a longer workshop, it's again a feasible experiment to do in situ. And here are some of the results, and as you can see, once again, it really excites the kids when they get to make their own crystals, and of course, get to take them home. Here are just some examples, closer up ones, some of these were done with um, cooling in a freezer, some of them were done at room temperature, some of them solutions were stirred, so the kids can indeed experiment and learn something. Now another crystal growth experiment that has been extremely successful was actually introduced by the Young Scientists Special Interest Group, and I would like to highlight that one here. They started in 2012 at the Boston meeting, where they actually contacted several high schools and worked with two high schools and 80 students to actually learn about protein crystallization. All of the resources were provided by him research, free of charge. And so they basically set up some crystallization experiments. And later on, the schools got to visit an x-ray facility. This one was at Boston University. About 20 of the students participated in that one. And they got to collect data, diffraction data, on their own homegrown crystals. That has to be exciting when you're in school. I would imagine that it would have excited me back then. And a couple of them actually got to attend the national ACA meeting and present their results in a poster. So some of you might even have seen that one and remember it. Obviously, this one had to start significantly before the meeting because you need time to teach the kids and to actually grow the crystals. And so the school teachers were instructed by Skype on how to set up the lysosine crystallization trace. One of the Boston teachers has liked this experiment so much that it has turned into an annual thing that he does with his high school class. So this is one of those things that we are really looking for. Not just doing something once, but having people take it and continue with it. Because that way we can really grow the appreciation and how many people are reached by crystallography. The YSIC has also worked with two Hawaiian schools in 2013 at the University of Manoa. And they are working with some schools in Albuquerque. In addition to that, they actually set up a little demo at the Science Museum yesterday where we were hosting a teacher workshop. And I can only say that that table was swamped with people the whole time they were there. So there were definitely a lot of people locally here that learned something about crystallography yesterday. And I would like to thank the YSIC for their efforts in this respect. The hope for this is to secure external funding at some point in time. Because this would easy, be easy to carry somewhere else, as long as there's a university close by that is willing to let them look at the diffraction of their crystals, instruction can be done by Skype, as the YSA can show. And here are just some pictures to actually show you how the students visited the facility, how they learned in the classroom about the crystallization. And here's a picture of the poster at the ACA meeting. And there is actually a bigger version of the poster that is in these slides, so you can have a look at it. 
if you're more interested in it. So that is fun with crystals. Like I said, that's obvious. The other thing we can do is we can have some fun with light. And this is what I call getting a little more serious about crystallography. The nice thing about crystallography and diffraction is that x-rays that are diffracted by atoms follow the same rules as the diffraction of light by slits. At least to a certain approximation that works very well to explain things. And so this is actually something that I was made to do way back when, when I was in high school. We were told to actually take a compass and draw what happens when you have spherical waves coming from an aperture. And I thought it was really fascinating that you could see where you would get overlap that actually led to constructive interference and where you would get destructive interference. So for scientifically oriented kids, even this can already be fun. Of course, you can do things even better when you go from only two slits to something that has a little more. And what we use for that are actually slides from the Institute for Chemical Education. And the two slides that we have used are the Discovery and VSEPR slides. The Discovery slide has, first of all, two slides, uh, two sets of lines with different spacings, and then two sets of lines with the same spacings oriented differently. So it very nicely illustrates the reciprocal space relationship of diffraction, because you can see how things that are far apart on the slide lead to diffraction spots that are closer together. You can also see that you preserve the 1D or 2D repeat in your diffraction pattern. The VSEPR slide, which is actually discontinued, but you can still custom order it. You just need to give them a little more lead time, we found out. It's also called structure of triatomic molecules. And on this slide, all of the repeat units are the same size, but what is different is what kind of shape of these triatomic molecules is in there. And what that does is it actually changes the diffraction intensities. So your spots all show up in the same location, but your intensity is very significant. If you're interested, I have those slides so you can look at them during coffee break. So that really allows us to summarize diffraction in a nutshell. Because what that means is that the locations of the spots in a diffraction pattern tell us about the size and symmetry of the unit cell, while the intensities tell us what is within each of those unit cells. And so that actually allows us to explain to somebody who does not know about Fourier transforms what diffraction is. And of course, if you want to, you can introduce Bragg's law, especially for kids that have also seen some trigonometry. It's kind of fun to derive that and to use it <coughs> for some basic math. We all know that it, this is an approximation, but for basic things, it works extremely well. <coughs> the other thing you can do is actually show them how this relates to crystallography by basically saying a hole scatters light, electrons in crystals scatter x-rays. So imagine that you have a whole pattern of electrons. And so this is actually from a book, Lead and Palmer, that I like to use for teaching crystallography. As you can see, this really does look like either single atoms or benzene molecules. And it does show you what happens to the diffraction patterns. So it shows you a molecular transform, and it shows you what happens when you start putting a repeat in, how you get the extinction in between from the interference fringes, and how when you have a long enough repeat, you start seeing something that really looks like a diffraction pattern. So once again, it's a nice analogy that anybody can follow. And of course, you can show them the opposite approach, where you show them how diffraction data are transformed into an electron density. In this case, again, you can make different analogies depending on what age level you're talking about, where you show them that if you don't measure enough data, you really don't get a nice electron density. If you measure more data, it changes the importance of knowing your overall intensity of the F000 is illustrated with this. And then, of course, when you measure some real amounts of data, you can actually get something that starts to look like the structure of the molecule from which this diffraction pattern was collected. So, fun with light definitely illustrates a lot about our science. It is a, lot, a little more serious, and of course, it does mean that there is some math behind it. But, as one of the teachers yesterday said, you know, now I can explain to them why they should learn math. <laughs> the last part is fun with symmetry. And this is, of course, where crystallography really intersects with math and also with arts. <laughs> symmetry and geometry are kind of close matches, and math classes do teach about these things. 
Many students don't really appreciate that this is useful. And we had a prime example yesterday when we held a teacher workshop where Joe Ng actually showed how symmetry, geometry, and some trigonometry how to solve the structure of DNA. And one of the teachers in attendance was extremely excited because she said, that is so awesome, now I can tell them why they need to learn this. Okay. <laughs> so, hey, that's fine. If that works, you know, we are happy to help. So, crystallographic achievements can really motivate students to learn some of this math. Why not use it? Of course, the other place where we see crystallography-oriented things is in art. And a very good example is M.C. Escher. You may be familiar with this picture of his reptiles. And he was actually inspired by crystallographers. His brother was the one who saw the similarities between his drawings and crystallographic papers. And he gave him some papers. And so Escher actually corresponded quite a bit with some of these crystallographers. Holya was actually one of the instrumental people to introduce him to the plane groups. And his creativity, of course, then combined with the rules for space filling patterns. And we actually had a lecture yesterday at the museum during the lunch hour. It was a public lecture. It was given by Doris Schatzschneider, and it was very well attended. It was titled MC Escher and Chris Lockfirst. And she really showed a lot of interesting pictures and how this all evolved and how he interacted with Chris Lockfirst. It turns out that while Escher really admired the crystallographers, some of the crystallographers also started promoting to use Escher's drawings to teach novices about symmetry, because it's so much easier to actually look at it than it is when you just have some atoms and you're not used to looking at it. And so Carolina McGillivray was probably one of the instrumental people there. She invited him to give a talk at the 1960 IUCR meeting, and she talked about his work at the next IUCR meeting, and then also published a book on symmetry aspects of Escher's drawings, and Escher actually himself considered this the crown of his life's work. So there's definitely a happy relationship between crystallographers and an artist. Now, I would like to briefly highlight a few special events and activities that are occurring during IYCR 2014. Some of what we've looked at so far obviously applies to any time, any year. You can do it whenever you have a chance. One of the big things for us is how to get attention. We want to attract people to crystallography. We want them to know about IYCR. And one of the things we want to do is actually highlight Nobel laureates, because crystallography has received a large number of Nobel Prizes, and we should probably present that as a sign of how important crystallography is. So one of the people that we are highlighting this year is Dor Dorothy Hodgkin. <coughs> because she was, number one, a very successful woman in science, so that's kind of a double outreach here. And of course, there's the 50-year anniversary of her receiving the Nobel Prize in 1964, and it's also the 20-year anniversary of her death this year. And it turns out that Google actually did commemorate her on May 12th with a doodle, and those of you who missed it, it was for her birthday, which was on May 12, 1910, and this is what the Google doodle for that day looked like. It was the structure of penicillin, which Dorothy, of course, saw. So that was kind of really neat. And I actually got text messages from some of my friends who had nothing to do with crystallography saying, have you looked at Google today? <laughs> so it is really going out there that really is reaching people. And it was actually shown in a large number of countries. There's a map on the website where you can look at it. Talking about websites, the task force has actually been working on putting together a website it is almost ready to launch. It's not quite there yet. You'll all get a, an email from your IYCR task force rep in your region when it is ready to launch. We want to actually collect educational materials there. That is one of the prime goals. It's a repository for this. This includes videos, handouts, ideas for hands-on activities. We also have a history page where you can read about milestones, Nobel Prizes, just stories about crystal Longfords. There's also a really neat fe feature called Crystal Connect, which allows people to connect with local crystallographers. If they, for example, want to set up a demonstration or a talk or something like that, or they just want some feedback. And um, while it is not completely online yet, I can give you a tiny little sneak peek at least at it, because I downloaded the preview file onto my computer. So this is what it'll look like. And as you can see, this is that Crystal Connect form 
which then allows you to fill in who you are, what you're looking for, where you're located, and people can be put in touch with you. Now, another very important button up here is that one. It says contests. Because who does not like contests, right? Now, one little plug here. If you have any material that would be appropriate for that website, please submit it, okay? It's a repository, but if you don't deposit things there, it won't work very well. So or to me, it's okay. If you have ed educational materials, send them to Martha Teeter, send them to your IYCR rep, we'll get them where they need to go, or Danielle Gray is actually the one who has really helped with putting together this website. Now, I did give you that little tab there that said contest, so one of the exciting things for IYCR 2014 is that we do have competition time. Other countries have done this for many years, but the United States will actually host their first national crystal growing competition this year in the fall. It is sponsored by Ward Science at the University of Buffalo, and it will run in October and November. It turns out that the winning crystals will actually become a permanent collection that will be on display at the University of Buffalo. So that should definitely be kind of cool to have your crystal honored there if you're one of the winners. There will be cash prizes, they will be looking both for best overall crystals and for the best quality crystals. And there are age categories K through 8 and 9 through 12. <coughs> there will also be a prize for the best teacher crystal. So teachers can participate too. The second thing that we have there is actually a video contest. So students can prepare short videos, either describing their own experiment, some crystallographic concept, their view on a crystallographic experiment or event or a crystallographer, so there's a lot of flexibility for that. This one will be hosted on Facebook, and it will start with online voting, but then a panel of experts will actually review the videos with the most votes, so that we don't just have a popularity contest, but we also look at you know, what is actually being said in these videos. Now for the crystals up here, there are also some regional crystal growing competitions going on. Some of them use other materials. For the national competition, alum will actually be used for this one. And here are some pages from the IYCR 2014 IUCR website, which show you what some of these crystals might look like. So this is from some international crystal growing competitions that were hosted in past years. And as you can see, people can grow some very impressive crystals at home. If that doesn't excite people, then I don't know what will. I'm certainly going home and trying some of this. <laughs> Of course, the other thing we have to do is some outreach to other societies, because like I said, we do want to make sure that scientists and engineers <coughs> understand, and of course, that also teachers understand how important crystallography is. So in terms of outreach to teachers, we have been hosting a Crystallography World of Wonders, or CWOW workshop, for several years. The first time was actually in 2010 in Chicago, but this year we've actually kind of taken it in, on the road. So yesterday, we hosted it at the New Mexico Museum for Natural History and Science, and that was actually very successful, to get together with the museum for publicity, to attract people, to talk to people. And we've also actually presented shorter versions of it. So Claudia Ron went to Boston in April for the National Science Teacher Association National Meeting, and I believe Martha is currently exploring the best format for presenting at a regional meeting in Long Beach in the fall. So we are trying to reach out to science teachers to make sure some of this gets into, incorporated into their curricula. And of course, especially the contest, if the students don't contribute, we don't really have a contest, right? Another very exciting um, development is that the American <coughs> Institute for Physics actually decided to include some diffraction and symmetry in their 2014 SOCs. So these are kits that are used for school outreach and they can basically be requested by society of physics students um, chapters to go to schools and demonstrate these things. Of course, with the International Year of Light coming up next year, these diffraction gradings that are included there may well be something that will live on into the next year. Also, the Materials um, Science Association has requested materials for their summer materials camps these are actually one-week camps. There are 40 of them that are held all across the United States. And in each camp, they have 25 teachers. And one of the things they were mainly interested in was education handouts that the teachers can take back, some history, some important events, but also 
What about careers in crystallography? Where may people go who study something like this? In terms of outreach to professional societies that are in engineering and science, there were special sessions or symposia to celebrate IYCR. The APS user meeting certainly highlighted it, but the ACS national meeting in Dallas had a whole symposium on IYCR, the Biophysical Society meeting in San Francisco, and the Minerals, Metals, and Materials Society meeting in San Diego, and there may be more. If there are, please submit those so that we can list them on the website so that we have a complete collection of where IYCR was promoted. It also turns out that the ACA and the ACS decided to join forces to present some webinars related to crystallography. The first one was actually held last week, and it was on crystallography and everyday materials. We had 465 attendees. The ACS was very happy with that. But they were especially impressed by the fact that we had 22% international attendance. They say usually they only get about 12 to 30%. There will be a second webinar in the fall, probably in October, on biological applications of crystallography. So these have definitely reached a lot of people. And one of the nice outcomes of this webinar was that in the end, when we asked, has crystallography ever done anything important for your research, 88% of the attendees actually <coughs> answered yes. So while in the beginning not everybody was using crystallography, they definitely got the message that crystallography is important for you, even if you... Workshops and schools are of course always ongoing. Many of them are annually held. For example, the Canadian <coughs> Crystallographic Society has a chemical crystallography workshop. The ACA has been running a small mo uh, molecule summer school for a long time. The University um, of Duquesne University in Pittsburgh will be holding a second instance of the Duquesne Powder Workshop. But one thing that is actually new this year is that the Colombian and Venezuelan societies for crystallography have gotten together to co-host workshops, both on powder and single crystal methods in June and September. And there will actually be two people from the US who will lend their expertise to the powder workshop. So it's kind of nice to see this international collaboration during <laughs> IYCR 2014. There are a couple of other things that kind of just were put together under miscellaneous. Matthew Doherty is actually working on a planetarium dome show. This one will include point and space groups, crystals, and minerals. One of the issues is to get funding for it. He has had trouble with that, but he might have somebody interested in actually sponsoring this. It may be transferable to other planetariums if it ever comes together. And I do have a version of the point groups on my computer, so if anybody wants to see it during coffee break, just find me, okay? It's not quite ready for release. He said, don't distribute it, but you can show it. So I do have that one. Marvin Hacker actually put together a very well-visited exhibit on crystals and crystallography at the biggest Texas open house, which is called UT Explore. There will be three evening public lectures on crystallography during the Montreal IUCR meeting, so that is definitely something that hopefully will attract a lot of people who are not crystallographers. And this is something local to me. The Girl Scouts in Northwest Ohio have actually decided to work together with us at the University of Toledo to develop some crystallography units. So we'll do the first one hour workshop next month, but the ultimate goal is to actually put together comprehensive materials that you can adapt to do anything from a one hour session to six times one hour weekly programs. And if we can put good instructions together, they think that they can put that into the curricula as something that can be distributed nationally for leaders to basically pull off and work with the kids on. So this would definitely be a nice way of reaching a lot of people. Now, some final words. One of the purposes that we need to think about is we have one international year for crystallography. But what we really want to do out of this year is to leave a legacy. Because we need to make sure that people appreciate our science into the future. Funding will obviously be influenced by that. And of course, if nobody cares about crystallography, who will be attending an ACA meeting in 10 or 20 years? If we don't groom them, they won't exist. So the website, once again, will be very instrumental to this. We want to collect materials. The contest may exist into the future, but the education materials, the history, any of these materials that will be accessible for teachers into the future will be very important. 
The dream would be to one day have this website available in multiple languages because the Americas obviously have English, French, Portuguese, and Spanish as the languages. At this point in time, we are happy if we get the English version underway. But, of course, the materials, once they are there, can be translated. In addition, this is also a plea from UNESCO, who has endorsed this International Year, because they are saying it gets more and more difficult to have International Years approved. So they are actually looking at things and want to see that it's not just a one-year celebration for those who are already in the field. So with that, please, all of you, do contribute, do submit materials, help with leaving a legacy, with making this website and this repository something that will really be worthwhile into the future. Thank you very much.